Hello and welcome to Early Childhood Ireland's podcast, which features interviews and discussions on all issues relating to high quality in the early years and school age care sector. In our episodes, we have a range of speakers who are leaders in the areas that matter to Early Childhood Ireland members. This podcast series is proudly supported by Aricus Insurance, which offers a comprehensive range of cover at discounted premiums for both business and personal insurance products. So visit www aricus.ie for more information. I'm Maura Corbett and I work with Early Childhood Ireland and today I'm delighted to be joined once again by my colleague Dr Christina Egan Mardell. I've mentioned before we've had great feedback on our new resources developed in partnership with Mother Tongues and supported by the Toy Show Appeal and Community Foundation Ireland and today Christina I'm really delighted to be able to chat with you about some of the the feedback and answer some of the specific questions we've received. Um, Christine is an early years specialist at Early Childhood Ireland. She's an early childhood teacher. She completed a BA in early childhood care and education at the Institute of Technology in Sligo and a doctorate of education at Victoria University, Wellington. And I know she really enjoyed working on Owlette. She's been so enthusiastic about it from the beginning. Uh, so, Christina, you're really welcome. Thanks for coming on again. Thanks, Mara. It's delighted to be able to chat again about Owlette. I'm so passionate about it. So any opportunity to talk about it and to really share some of the questions that have come up for educators in practice is a really great way to spread the message about Owlette and how other people can use it. Absolutely. So as you say, we've got questions from educators and and so on. So this episode is going to be a bit like a a quick fire round on a a quiz show. (laughs) So are you ready? I think so. Let's give it a go. Right. How did you choose the lullabies? We had no set list of lullabies or sorry, languages that we wanted to choose. More so, we just wanted to get as much variation and linguistic diversity as we could. So our partners for this project was Mother Tongues, and they very kindly reached out to their membership and asked if there was any professional singers who knew a lullaby in their home language and who was interested in singing it. So there was no specific predetermined, we need to get this language, this language, this language. It was the languages that Mother Tongues, I suppose, encounter more frequently. Yeah, it was just about uh, the languages that was available and hopefully that would represent the languages that were spoken within Ireland. So the next question is uh, refers specifically to um, one of the lullabies that has um, kind of depressing meaning. Listening to it, it kind of reminds me of ones like um, London Bridge is Falling Down and Ring a Ring a Rosie. But um, somebody had a query to know were there concerns about um kind of the darkness of of um some of the lullabies affecting young children i think that's a great question because the history of lullabies themselves comes from quite a different perspective lullabies were originally designed to almost scare children to sleep and over time they have taken on a very different format and it's about soothing children to sleep but you know in particular with lullabies that might have a more sadder note behind them. I guess it's important to think about how music is powerful in that it offers a place for emotional expression right across the spectrum from happy, excited, scared or sad. And music invokes emotions in all of us. And with the lyrics of a lullaby or any song, it adds that other layer of meaning to a music, allowing us to relate to it, connect to it on a personal level and even growing our sense of empathy and connection. So music that also includes lullabies allows both us as adults and as children to experience and continue our own emotional development. If we think about older children, perhaps those in the preschool age group in particular, if they're interested in what the lyrics are and are asking their educators about them, it's a great opportunity to talk to them about different cultural and societal norms and explore why a person might be feeling sad, but also to think about How can we show kindness and compassion and talk that through with the child? Because you'll find they have an exceptional level of maturity and will really want to explore this in a safe space with you as the educator. 
And it reminds me a little bit of um, Dr. Ferry Labour's idea in, in experiential learning and the box full of feelings that, you know, children will encounter situations in life that can be scary, that can be upsetting and that can evoke, like you say, the emotion, various, various emotions. It's not all, you know, kind of joy and happiness all, all the time. And that, you know, hearing songs that cover kind of, you know, darker aspects of life can help children to come to terms with that and maybe develop a sense of resilience, which is an important uh, disposition to, to have as we get older. Absolutely. Most educators are familiar with this idea of emotional development with children and supporting them through their emotional development because it is a journey to learn. And while we would like children to only have positive experiences, to know that they're happy, they will also have sad experiences and different feelings. And we can provide an opportunity for them to explore those in a healthy way and help them to build that resilience. So when they encounter them on their own, they will have those tools and strategies to understand what they're feeling. And there's probably a bit as well, is there, that... You know, if a child does understand, first of all, I suppose most children um, mightn't always understand the words of all the the lullabies. But if they do understand them and it does raise issues for them, it can help you to support them by, you know, engaging in uh, other professional support services that might be appropriate. So it can help you to identify issues that could arise for a child. Absolutely. I think there's a lot of opportunities that music creates and more than just being something nice to listen to in the background, it can really help us in all areas of development. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, I'd like to mix in some English lullabies to expand the depth of the playlist. Can you recommend any? Yes. So I suppose to set the context of our lullaby collection, we chose to only include Uh, other languages or uh, non-English languages within the collection because we found that there was such a wide variety of beautiful English language lullabies already available and you'll find a quick search on any of the platforms would bring up some fantastic playlists and of course the most famous ones such as Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, Rockabye Baby and Hush Little Baby will probably be in most collections. And any song can become a lullaby if you kind of hum it slowly and it's something a child is is familiar with and when we were chatting about some of the areas that we might cover I was telling you about my little granddaughter who uh, is soothed by Bob Marley because that's uh, music her parents listened to when uh, when she was in utero so any song can be a lullaby any song that's familiar to you oh absolutely I've heard that myself with my own son when he was a baby we were singing Uh, songs we were trying to sing some songs in Irish that we didn't remember the full lyrics to or how the full chorus went but it became a lullaby over time as we slowed it down and we uh, sung it to him as he was trying to go to sleep so anything that is familiar and comforting to you as a family or even as an educator makes for a great lullaby. Great Uh, next one I'd like to use more music in my setting can you suggest any additional multilingual musical resources that would allow me to build on the work of Owlette? Well, as I was just saying, absolutely love to hear this question because music is so beneficial to children right across cognitive, emotional, social and physical development. It can have such a powerful impact. So what I would suggest here is tap into that expertise that's already available at your door. Ask your parents in your service, the families and the wider community Ask them, do they have particular songs or playlists in their home language that they would recommend to play? Um, You might find that they already play a good few at home already, so they could have some great ideas. You could also ask them if they have any traditional musical instruments at home and would they play them for the children in the service one day? It really doesn't matter what level of skill they have in playing that instrument. It's the experience of a different sound and a different instrument that will ignite children's curiosity and importantly, their cultural awareness. I loved your story of uh, bringing a bower on into the setting that you were working in when you lived abroad. Yes. So um, every St. Patrick's Day, I would bring in a bower on that we had at home um, as a way of showing a different instrument. Um, I had no idea how to play it. Absolutely not. 
But the children didn't judge me for that in any way. They were so excited to see something different. And together we figured out how to make the noise between the baron and the stick and where you would tap it on different places and how it would make a different sound and tone. And through that experience, for me personally, I learned so much more about the history of the Bauron. So it's a really exciting exercise for anyone that has an opportunity to look at different musical instruments. When you said the children didn't ju judge you, it reminded me of uh, Maria Gallagher's comment in her episode last week that the children aren't like X Factor judges. It doesn't matter how you sing, it's that you sing. So I think the same applies to bringing in musical instruments and exploring them with the children and all yes. learning together. Absolutely. Don't ever be afraid of just bringing something in or singing a song or giving it a go. The children think you're amazing as their educator anyway. You're already in their highest expectations. What you're doing is bringing in something different, bringing in something that will spark a bit of curiosity and a bit of exploration. And as I mentioned, Mairead, um, another query we had is about Mairead's mention in the last episode about using the lullabies as, pre you, you know, using the melody with um, the, lang the language of the setting as kind of transition calls. So can you can you give us your kind of opinion on that? Is there a risk that the lullabies might stop being joyful and start to sound like alarms if they're used in a very instructional way have you thoughts on that yeah I think absolutely you can use lullabies to signal for a transition I think it's a lovely gentle way of indicating a change in the routine for children you'll find that the music is probably used together with the educator's verbal communication to notify that it is a transition so for example Many people will be familiar with the idea of using white noise as a sleep aid for babies. We hope it will help, but we also change their nappy. We feed them. We get them comfortable in their cots. We cuddle them. We use all of these strategies together to support babies to fall asleep. So I think it's all about balance in using lullabies as a type of transition call. You don't have to use it every day or for every transition moment. It's something that you can have a think about and meaningfully incorporate it into a part of your routine for something perhaps that's special. That this ritual is is important and, uh, you know, that rarely that comes to be valued over time. And I yes. suppose it's keeping it playful as well, that, uh, you know, you, you can determine yourself whether something becomes just like kind of background noise or something that remains playful and familiar and kind of nearly ritualistic to to the child that it's like the transition isn't happening unless that's that said that needn't become boring when it becomes um you know a very obvious part of the the routine and transition yes educators have the best knowledge of how their space their classroom works they know what the children enjoy and what they respond to. So they can, they're can they best placed to make the decisions around how the lullabies are working for them and if it's time to change them. You kind of touched on this already, Christina. You mentioned preschool children. Um, but the question came in that while um, Owlette was developed for children under two, and in the first episode you, you spoke about how the name Owlette was um, identified as a suitable name for the project, but... Query came in to know, can the lullabies and re other resources be used with older children like in the, um, the preschool or school age, um, school age care age children? Absolutely. We've heard from several members already um, how they're using the lullaby playlist and the board book with children of all ages. So not just those who might be in the baby room or in the younger toddler group. We know that um, members are finding lots of different ways to use them, which is brilliant. My advice to services is each child will interact and respond differently to the resources. So just follow their lead, make them available, see how they respond to them, see what questions they ask about them and follow their lead and go from there. And just for, for people who may not be familiar with the, the book, I suppose, just to say that that book was gifted to settings with children aged under two. So because, because the focus of the, the project was children under two, all the resources can be used with, with children of all ages in a way that they engage with and that interests them, basically. OK, next one um, is about the languages. Um, I don't feel confident using the various languages. They're not my 
my mother tongue, they're not my native language. Um, any suggestions on how I can use um, the, the lullabies uh, or the, the words in the book, the text in the book, when I don't speak that language as my native language? I think that's a really relevant question. And it's something I've personally experienced when I was teaching overseas and there was different languages and I would feel really nervous about picking up the book that I knew wasn't going to have English in it and how, how would I continue with it? So what I would suggest is with the Owlet project, we have complementary resources. So draw on them to make things easier. You'll find that with the lullaby playlist, if you play the lullaby, it can help you to learn the pronunciation of those words. Particularly the words that are in the book are an extract of the lullaby and they often come from the course. So it will repeat, be repeated quite frequently in the lullaby on the playlist. If you happen to have families in your space that speak that language, also ask them as well. They might give you some great tips for how to pronounce it. And especially when you can speak to someone and have a two-way conversation, it can help those pronunciations to stick and you can learn them that way. I think what's most important is just about giving it a try. Like I said about the instruments, you don't need to be perfect, but you'll find that parents and families really appreciate the efforts you make in learning another language and interacting with their child with that language. Most importantly, children also receive this positive message that it's a good thing to explore a new language and to give it a try. And that's a message that they will take it with them right into primary school and further as they come into contact and start to explore many other languages. I suppose too, the fact that the on YouTube, the English translation is on each individual lullaby on our YouTube channel. So you, you can get a sense of what you're singing. And I think they're like earworms anyway. They kind of, once you listen to them a couple of times, you're, you're singing them, even if you don't necessarily understand words, that they're they're quite easy to, and you mentioned about them being repetitive. So it, there isn't that much to learn when you actually listen to them. It's the same words. It's like even something like Prairie Jaca or, you know, it's the same line repeated several times with maybe a slightly different ending sometimes. So they're quite easy to get into the hang of. Yes. And I think, you know, many of our members listening today will know pop songs that are in different languages that they can say probably a full course in because we've heard it repeated so often on the radio. Lullabies Excellent. with different languages can be a very yeah. similar experience for you. If you hear it yeah. frequently, you'll just start to say it. It's like exactly. when you draw on your repertoire of nursery rhymes. You don't actually remember sitting down to learn them off by heart. You just heard them from your colleagues singing them or you heard them in different places so frequently you pick them up. Excellent point. That's a, the pop songs is a really good point, actually. Um, this is kind of related and maybe you've it covered, but just if you want to add anything else to it, um, how do I read the book? Because it has limited text and I don't speak all the languages. Um, it's primarily a picture book, but uh, any ideas um, relating specifically to the book? Yeah, and that's that's a good point. And I can see how that might come up in practice because the books were designed with under two year old children in mind and how it would be most engaging for them. And um, so there is limited written text in them and not everyone speaks many languages and that's OK. What I would suggest is invite the children to get involved in the storytelling session with you. And whether that's your babies, your toddlers or your preschoolers, ask them to tell you what they see on each page. Can they describe the people, the animals, what's happening in the background, the colours? Ask them to tell you what do they think is happening and they can read the book to you. And what might happen next and what do they think is going to happen? So their imaginations get um, ignited and uh, can take flight, if you like. Absolutely. The book is a prompt. Um, just a foundation of getting started in a what would likely be a fantastic story. And then if I don't have children in my setting from the countries represented in, in the lullabies, um, or if I have children from other countries, uh, what are your thoughts on using Owlet in that situation? One of the principles that was underlying for the Owlet project was about supporting children's sense of identity and belonging, but also offering a positive experience of linguistic and cultural diversity to all children. So the lullabies and the book offer a chance to explore different cultures and different languages 
regardless of who is in your classroom or in your space. So there might not be a child in your space today that's from one of those countries, but there could be come next September. There could be children in your class that go to football classes at the weekend and there's a child there that speaks Hindi or that they might go to the playground on the weekend and there's a child there who speaks Spanish. Or when they start school, they're likely to meet a whole new group of children who can speak other languages. So what you're doing is supporting all children to positively view culture and languages, regardless of where they'll interact with people. Because in this way, they're building their interest, they're building their curiosity and seeing that languages is a great thing. Absolutely. It's, it's that bit that if they're not in your setting community, children will encounter children from other countries in their broader community, be that football or in the playground or, or whatever. So that's why it's, a, it's just vital. Are there likely to be future projects? We had OWL last year, which, which was uh, kind of dramatic arts and puppetry and so on with older children, um, which was very popular as well. And people can find out more about that on our website. But uh, are there likely to be future projects with additional languages or um, other ways of creative expression? We would love the opportunity to expand on Outlet Lullabies of the World, um, particularly with a version two, and record a whole new lullaby collection with different languages. So we're really busy planning for the future right now. So watch this space and we'll certainly keep you updated um, as we start to explore that a little bit further. So I suppose, Christina, in our, in our chat and a lot of the questions, because I suppose the, the, the book is very visual and the uh, the play, the the lullaby playlist is, is very auditory and, you know, you can use them while you're doing something else. The third part to the Owlet project is the e-learning toolkit. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about what's in that? Um, how people can access it and how that can um, support further developments in your setting around uh, plurilingualism. We've had a great response already to the e-learning programme. And I think it's particularly because it's short and it's designed to be succinct and it's designed to give you that snapshot and build on the knowledge you have already. So if you've got 20 minutes to spare and you want to think about multilingualism in your service and how you can use lullabies to support that, this is a great resource to engage with the e-learning program. And if you hop onto our website and go onto our learning hub on our pedagogy space is where you can find it. It gives you a chance to think about the benefits of multilingualism and looking at it through the lens of lullabies in this example. What are the benefits for children? What are the benefits for the educators themselves, but also for the service? There's lots of great ideas on how you can incorporate lullabies into your daily routines. That might be through new children settling in or supporting children with emotional regulation. There's great prompts for you to think about, how can I take this one step further? Great, thanks for that that reminder of that ongoing resource that's there if you want to delve deeper than the the lullabies. So I suppose to finish, um, I'm going to go back to Ashther and it, Ashther discusses how relationships build children's sense of identity. And it says, giving children messages of respect, love, approval and encouragement enables them to develop a positive sense of who they are and a feeling that they have an important contribution to make wherever they are. Positive messages about their families, backgrounds, cultures, belief and languages help children to develop pride in who they are. So can you just briefly take us through how um, Aulet supports that, Christina? Yes, absolutely. And I think I'll start with recognising how forward thinking and innovative Ashter really is in identifying the absolute importance of children having a sense of identity and belonging because I'll explain here what that looks like on a daily basis for them but forming that strong sense of identity and that sense of belonging at an early age will support children through the rest of their lives so when children have those strong sense of identity and belonging they develop self-confidence and when children know who they are and they feel good about themselves they're more likely to face challenges and new experiences with resilience. And something COVID has taught us so much about is resilience and how we need to look at building resilience. So it's about supporting children's self-confidence, which comes from their identity and their sense of belonging. 
when children feel a sense of belonging in their earlier service in particular, they're getting that sense of emotional security. They feel part of a group or a community which can act as a buffer when it comes to times of stress and anxiety. And I think when we're looking at a wider picture, when children have a strong sense of identity and belonging, they're better prepared to build healthy relationships with their peers, with their educators, with their families, as they understand the social norms and they're more empathetic towards one another. And that's a, that's a great point to end on resilience and empathy. Uh, Christina, thanks for taking us through those, those questions. And thank you too to our members who sent in the questions that um, I'm sure if, if one educator is wondering about something like that, there are others wonder, wondering too. So, um, Christina, thanks a million for taking the time to come back on and talk to us. You're most welcome. And uh, for any educator that hasn't had a chance yet, do check out the Lullaby Collection. And if you're a service that has under two-year-old children, you'll also have received your book. And also to check out the e-learning programme. Um, we wish you all the best with them. Thanks a million, Christina. And um, you know, keep the feedback coming, keep the questions coming, and uh, we'll we'll get back to you. So, thank you for listening to this episode of Early Childhood Ireland's podcast, which is proudly supported by Arakis Insurance. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, spread the word to your friends and colleagues, and stay tuned for our next episode. 